and welcome to my session, Managing Shared iPads Remotely Around the World. I'm your wonderful host, Kelly Watkins Conrad, and I'm a senior project engineer here at Jamf. Essentially what that means is I'm the Apple administrator for all the innovation hubs around the world. And that covers pretty much anything technology related from the setup of the devices to the actual training of our facilitators. The devices and the experiences that I'm sharing with you all here today are pulled from the innovation hubs that I manage globally. I have several items that I want to talk with you all here today. First, the setup. That will include the setup of the MDM, getting student information into our systems, as well as the setup of the actual devices. After that, we'll cover deployment. We'll talk about how we get our devices ready to be shipped, where they go, and what happens once they arrive, including how the iPads themselves are used. After that, we'll cover some of the challenges that we've come across while using our shared iPads, as well as some of the solutions that we've found. And finally, we'll talk about the victories that we've had while using these shared iPads and the impact that they've had on the communities. So let's go ahead and get started with the setup. And when it comes to the first step in this process, it's choosing the proper MDM for you. For us, being at Jamf, there are a lot of MDM solutions that are available, but because we are utilizing these shared iPads in a student environment, it really came down to do we use Jamf Pro or are we gonna utilize Jamf School? Well, because we are heavily iPad centric and because of the awesome integrations that Jamf School has with Apple School Manager along with locations and the extensive Jamf teacher features, we decided that Jamf School was the correct MDM for our deployment here. Also, Jamf School is a little simpler for our facilitators to use, especially because they're not technically trained. Once you have your MDM in place, we can then go ahead and decide on our device setup. For us, we utilize shared iPads. And why exactly are we using shared iPads in our environments? Well, we have a few different reasons. First, you have a custom login experience. What that means is you may have one student who doesn't speak English very well, but instead is more comfortable speaking Spanish. When they log on to the shared iPad, it's set up in Spanish for them. That child then leaves, the next student comes in in the next class, maybe they don't speak any Spanish. So for them when they log in, everything may be in English or in another language that they're most comfortable with. That's an experience that you can have with a shared iPad that's unique. The other piece is that you're able to save your work. What that means, you have a student that ideally would have the same iPad every time. So when they log onto that device, all of their work is already there. However, there may be an issue with the iPad itself. Maybe it's broken, maybe another student took it, and we need to utilize another device for that student. They can go ahead, pick up a different iPad and log on and all of their work is already there for them. Another reason why we utilize shared iPads is because some of these locations where we're using shared iPads don't have a ton of additional space. So we really need to make sure that we're utilizing that space as efficiently as possible. And on the flip side of that coin, that also allows us to have multiple students with one iPad, which means that we can impact more kids. And kind of in that same vein, it means that we're able to have our money stretch a little bit further and without shared iPads, some of our largest impacts just simply wouldn't be possible uh, due to the space and the funding. When it comes to either allowing the most amount of kids to use an iPad or have just a few kids getting to use an iPad like a one-to-one -one scenario, the shared iPad is going to win for us every single time. The shared iPads allow our kids to have the ability to create and learn in a space that encourages it. Our facilitators and teachers use something called Technology Enabled Active Learning, or TEAL Plus, when using our shared iPads in our innovation hubs. And I will explain a little bit more on what TEAL Plus entails a little later in this presentation. Before you can set up your shared iPads, you're going to need your student data integrated into your Apple School Manager and into your MDM. And that gets us into which method do we utilize to get that student information into Apple School Manager. For many districts in the United States, they utilize a student information system or SIS. However, 
Apple School Manager also allows you to utilize an SFTP upload. For many districts here in the United States, having the SIS already in place allows for an extremely easy integration to allow for that student information to be pulled into Apple School Manager. However, with our innovation hubs all across the globe in different hemispheres, different schedules and holidays, we quickly found out that student information systems became really complicated for our really simple use case. So for us, utilizing the SFTP upload, we were re-uploading our data every single time a change is made, made more sense for our particular needs. Once we've decided how we're going to get that student information into our systems, we then had the challenge of how do we actually get that information? Unlike in the United States, where districts do a really great job of having all that student information nice and easy to read, everything organized, that's not how it necessarily is everywhere else in developing countries. When I would ask for student information, I would sometimes get an Excel sheet, which was great. Sometimes I'd get a Microsoft Word document, which was okay. But then I would also get pictures of handwritten student rosters, or sometimes I wouldn't have anything at all. And I would literally have to have the facilitator go in, collect all the names of the students that are in their class and send it to me. It quickly became apparent that we needed a better way to get a hold of the student information. So what we did was create a template that you can see here that is the initial student intake form that allows us to input the student first and last name as well as the grade that they're in. This has really made it a lot easier to have it be universal and allow for everyone to get sent this uh, form once they become part of the program. For those of you that are interested, I have included this template that I've created in the session handout if this is something that might be interested for you. So once we have all that student data, we then utilize the templates from Apple School Manager to get that data into our instances. And there are several templates from Apple School Manager that we have to fill out when we utilize the SFTP upload. That includes our classes, students, staff, courses, locations, as well as rosters. And all of this must be filled out before we can combine all of it into our compressed zip file. Once we have compressed it into a zip file, we are now able to upload this file into our SFTP server. For us, we utilize FileZilla to do this. Then our SFTP server is connected to our Apple School Manager instance. We are then able to upload this into Apple School Manager. And after about 20 seconds or so, all of that student data is then available in our Apple School Manager instance. So we're able to see here that all of our new items have been successfully added. We're looking good so far. If we added in any other schools, we would also see them in our locations tab on the left hand side here. If we go under users, we're able to see all of the new students that we have just added. The next piece after we, after we have added in our students is to create temporary logins for these students. So, I'm going to go ahead and select our users and then select the button to create a new login. We are then going to go ahead and send these temporary passcodes for our students for that initial login. We just use 1234 because it's really easy for young students to remember. Once the students log in that first time, this is the only time they will be using this temporary passcode. After, after they have used that, they will then set a passcode that they will then remember going forward. And this is important in order to log on to the shared iPads. So all of our sign-ins have been created. Let's go ahead and get this data into our Jamf school so that we're able to have these classes show up on our shared iPads. So back in Jamf school here, we will then sync this data back from ASM into our MDM so we can see all of our classes and students. Once we go ahead and press this button here, the changes are being synchronized. Once that button turns blue again, everything has been completed. Next, let's go ahead and assign our shared iPads to our class. In the classes on the left hand side, we're able to see all the classes that have been imported into our MDM. When I go ahead and select that class, I'm able to see all the teachers and students that are assigned to that class. Going back into my classes section, I then can go ahead and select that class and then I can select the button to add a shared iPad to assign our shared iPads to that class. 
this is really important because this is how a student is able to actually see their class and actually log on to the iPad. So don't forget this step, otherwise you may not be able to log on to your shared iPad. In Apple School Manager, we have already assigned our devices to their MDM server. And after that sync that we just did a little bit ago, we can now see all of these devices are waiting to be enrolled. We have also created our automated device enrollment profile, which has our custom setup assistant, including the instructions to set up our iPads as shared iPads. We then simply assign that profile to our devices. And this should be done before you even turn your iPads on or take them out of their brand new box. Now we're ready to go ahead and set up our devices. For those devices, other Jamfs are able to utilize their VTO or volunteer time off to help set up these devices before they're sent overseas. This is a really great way to get Jamfs out into our communities and give some of their time to help out with a really great cause. These devices are being set up at our Partner Matters office in St. Louis Park, which is a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Once we get these devices turned on, they go through that setup assistant and then restart to have that extra step of being set up as a shared iPad. We then go ahead and log on to these iPads using a guest account, which is a temporary session, and then we start downloading the applications. We do this because internet can be extremely limited in some of these locations, or we may not have internet for several days or weeks after the devices get there. This allows us to start utilizing those iPads right away once we arrive in country. Once the applications have loaded, it's time to send them along to their final destination. Next, let's talk about the deployment of these devices. These devices are then sent to one of three types of innovation hubs to be unboxed and then finished sending up. One of the type of innovation hubs that we have is a station. This is really great for our really small deployments. It simply takes a table where you have kids sitting around, a TV and an Apple TV. This is a really great cost efficient way to make an impact in some of these areas without needing a bunch of capital to get started. The next type of innovation hub is one that maybe some of you have actually seen before. This is our mobile hub. This is out, an outfitted shipping container that has five tables in there with, you guessed it, our Apple TVs and TVs. This is something that some of you may have seen, as I mentioned, at one of our past JDUCs. So hopefully some of you had the opportunity to actually walk through this mobile hub before. Now, the initial idea was that we would send one of our shipping containers to all of our locations. However, we have found instead that our mobile hub does a really great job as being a temporary location while we are instead building our ultimate goal, which is building a center. This is now our goal for every location where we have an innovation hub. These are custom built spaces that are still similar to our mobile hub. You can see that we still have our tables, but this time there's a lot more space in the middle. So when it comes to utilizing technology enabled active learning, we really want to get the kids out of the typical environment where they may be learning. So having all that space to do coding with Sphero balls, being able to do more uh, spread out work, being able to move around is something that is really great and something that we really encourage. The other piece that you may not have noticed is that we have tables at different heights. So if we have a child that's feeling a little restless, they're moving around, they're grooving around, they can't stay focused, instead of kicking them out and not having them be a part of the group and the learning experience, instead, our facilitator can move them to one of the desks where they can actually stand up. So that is just another way that the innovation hubs are providing equity to our students to ensure that we're able to meet them at what their needs are for learning. So we have now seen the three different types of innovation hubs where some of our shared iPads will go. You may be wondering where can I actually see one of these innovation hubs? Where are they located? Well, we have 16 locations all across the globe. Our first, Grace Academy in Teton, Yan, Haiti. After that, we have Hope Academy in City Soleil, Haiti, which is currently do closed due to civil unrest in that location. Next, we have Malaika House in Uganda, Victoria Falls Primary School in Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe, 
teach at Kunda Primary and Secondary School in Harare, Zimbabwe, which is its capital, Huangi Mankamp Primary School in Huangi National Park, Zimbabwe, Musi Oyotunya High School, located in Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe, NBA Africa in Senegal, which is currently closed due to COVID, Michelle Bayat School in Kabul, Afghanistan, Urban Ventures in Minneapolis, Minnesota, JJ Legacy in North Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Conway Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, St. James Independent School District in St. James, Minnesota, Nichilbe High School at Huangay National Park in Zimbabwe, Little Earth in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and last, King George VI in Belawayo, Zimbabwe. And that location is actually really unique because it's a school specifically for disabled and deaf students. And so for those of you that are familiar with the awesome accessibility features that Apple has, I'm really excited for them to be able to utilize those capabilities to the fullest there. Currently, our mobile hub is actually at that location while they're currently having um, progress building the center there. So really excited to hopefully share some news about that soon. Once our devices have been received in country at one of these locations, how exactly do our kids and facilitators actually use the shared iPads? Well, that's where Teal Plus comes in. And Teal Plus, again, technology enabled active learning, essentially means that we have student centric learning. I'm sure many of you remember the days of being in school, you're sitting in rows, the teacher stands at the whiteboard, they write something on the board, you copy that down. The teacher says something, you say it back to them. That is not what Teal Plus is doing. Instead, our teacher is off to the side asking questions. And instead, we have our students actually going and kind of teaching each other. And when a student finds a solution to whatever they're doing, the teacher is able to broadcast that student's device so that they can tell the class how they came to that solution. And so I've talked about how the teacher can broadcast the, the student's solution. You may be wondering what exactly does that mean? Well, we have a few tools that allows you to utilize Teal Plus successfully in the classroom. And the first tool is Apple Classroom, a free application provided by Apple that is MDM agnostic. There's also Jamf Teacher, another free application that does need to be tied to a Jamf MDM, either Jamf Pro or Jamf School. And setting up these applications are really easy. On the MDM side, simply assign your shared iPads to your class, which we've already done. Next, go ahead and assign your teacher to their particular iPad. And there's no step three. Our, now our teacher can use both of these applications and they can save their voice from trying to yell over all of the students while they are utilizing their shared iPads. So at this point, I'd like to talk a little bit more about some of the unique features each of these applications bring and what they can be done for the teacher in the classroom. First, with Apple Classroom. There are a few unique features here, including being able to see your students' iPad screens, being able to airplay a student's device to an Apple TV, as well as being able to mute these devices. I'm sure there are several of you already that can think of that one application that the students love to put on full blast for whatever reason, and how much you would love to be able to silence it. Apple Classroom can help you with that. Let's go ahead and take a look at what this actually looks like in the application here. I apologize in advance for the kind of crummy screenshot here, but I'm gonna go ahead and just walk you through it. But essentially, all of that student information that we've imported a little earlier today, we're now able to see our class and our students in the Apple Classroom application. And we actually have the ability to take action on our entire class as a whole here. So again, a few unique features to Apple Classroom, being able to view our students' screens in near real time, being able to, uh, actually mute these devices, and we also can take these actions on individual students here. So again, being able to mute the device, and we're also able to airplay that device. So I mentioned earlier that when a student finds a solution, our teacher can broadcast them. Utilizing Apple Classroom, this is how the teacher is able to do that. They're also able to clear the passcode on the device. So I'm sure this never happens, but 
Let's say someone has their friend get a hold of their iPad and they change their passcode. Instead of that being a huge distraction where the teacher is now not able to use that iPad, they're able to go ahead and clear that passcode and get right back to class time. The other application, very similar to Apple Classroom, is Jamf Teacher. There are a few exclusive features for Jamf Teacher that you're able to take advantage of, such as clearing restrictions that you've set as a teacher, being able to start a remote class over Zoom, being able to utilize messages to communicate with your students, as well as being able to create lessons. In the Jamf Teacher application, we can see our classes that we've imported from Apple School Manager. We can also see lessons that you've created. And lessons essentially are applications that you want to show or hide, as well as specific links or categories of applications that you want to show and hide. So it makes it really easy to limit the distractions during class time. And the nice thing is that once class is done, those restrictions that you've set as a teacher are lifted, so you're not stepping on anyone else's toes afterwards. And again, very similar to Apple Classroom, you're able to see your students that are online in this application. And you're also able to take actions to the class as a whole, such as starting that remote class over Zoom, clearing the teacher restrictions that you may have set, and just like we could at Apple Classroom, we can also take some actions on individual students. Again, clearing restrictions that you've set, being able to go ahead and send a message to that student, as well as making sure that their Bluetooth is turned on. Now, with both of these applications together, not only are we able to do those previous exclusive features, but both of them will also allow you to lock kids into specific applications, websites, and also allow you to lock the iPad. Now, I'm sure some of you have tried yelling over kids that have had a bunch of iPads and you find that it's really difficult to get their attention back on you. But send that uh, command to lock the iPad, you would not believe how quickly a classroom becomes completely quiet and all the eyes are on you. That is something that you are able to utilize. And you're also able to group kids together. So again, when it comes to collaborating, this makes it really easy for you to put students into groups and assign specific applications or websites to those particular students. And so I've also included in our session handout teacher guides for using both of these applications, which are incredibly well done. I highly recommend that all of you take the opportunity to read through those. So let's go ahead and see how our facilitators are actually using these applications. In this picture here, we're training our facilitators on how to utilize Apple Classroom and Jamf Teacher with the student iPads. They're able to see firsthand what actions they're able to take on their student devices in order to keep their lesson on track. The next piece is we have a few rules for the adults. We don't have any rules for the students, contrary to what you may think. Everything in our innovation hub, as well as on the iPads themselves, are fair game for students to touch. We encourage students to try and touch. It's only the adults that we have to worry about. So for whatever reason, whenever you ask a student to do something on the iPad, and if the student doesn't know immediately what to do, I'm willing to bet more than likely you will find an adult who will go in and just go and touch the iPad for them. That is not allowed, not allowed in the Teal Plus model. Instead, adults have to put their hands behind their back and they have to use their voice and explain with their words what to do. And if the student picks wrong, that's totally okay. Picking wrong is the whole point of Teal Plus because if a student chooses wrong, we're not going to lose the building. We're not gonna have the iPad taken away. We're just able to go ahead Try again, no big deal. And our teachers, are they don't even have a desk. They're not allowed to sit. They have to be moving around asking questions. And the really important piece here is that a lot of teachers, especially in the United States, they see success as a quiet classroom. Students are heads down, they're working hard, they're going through the lessons really quick. And if they don't have to interrupt, that would be great. That is not our goal here with Teal Plus. In fact, we want our facilitators to interrupt these kids. We don't want these kids sitting there and being quiet because it's not the process 
of going through and completing all of these things as quick as possible, it's, or sorry, it's not the task, I'm sorry, that we want them to go through and complete as quick as possible. It's the process of going through and learning it and working with other students and teaching them how to do it too. And so that's something that has been really challenging for the adults to kind of grasp. The kids catch on right away. They're the only ones, uh, the adults are the only ones that need to be reminded constantly um, on what they need to be doing for Teal Plus. So again, we have our teachers going around asking questions, showcasing students, utilizing AirPlay for ones that have found solutions. And instead of trying to yell over the class to get their attention, utilize Apple Classroom or Jamf Teacher to pause those iPads in order to ask them questions. So those are things that you can do in your classroom today to utilize Teal Plus. The next piece I'd like to talk about are some of the challenges that we've had when managing our shared iPads and our innovation hubs. My biggest challenge is being remote for all of the locations. I can't physically see these devices. And so communication is really, really important on my part. Every device in question requires knowing the serial number and which location that they're at. Because more often than not, I would get an email from one of our facilitators and they would say, iPad 2 needs an application pushed to it. And I would say, I don't know which iPad iPad 2 is. I can guess maybe. However, it's not uncommon for these devices to get moved around in our Zimbabwe locations. They get moved around a lot. And so for me to assume which device needs something done to it is never a good idea. So we've had to get into the habit of always saying which serial number so that I'm sure that I'm not doing something to a device that they didn't think that they were referring to. And, you know, those are challenges that are always going to be there and they're always ongoing. But I want to share with you some challenges that we've come across and actually solved with the shared iPads. The first challenge is to add a new user, contact your administrator. And we saw this particular error when a user was trying to sign with a user that looked to exist, but it actually didn't. Um, this was an issue at several of our locations, and I couldn't find anything about what this was or how to solve it online. So thankfully for all of you, hopefully this might be helpful for you. What it really came down to is that when we had the rosters update, we would have some of these old logins showing on the iPad. And even though those accounts were gone, they still showed up like they were there to be able to be logged into. And so what ended up happening is I was poking around in Jamf School and under the advanced menu, I found this particular command called clear cache. And I decided, let's just see what happens. And I go ahead, I sent a command to one iPad because you always got to test, don't send it to everything all at once. And sure enough, it cleared all of the recently logged in accounts so that only the new ones showed. Once we figured that out, we sent it out to all of the devices and that problem was solved. The next challenge that we came across is actually very region specific. So in Kabul, Afghanistan, all of the young boys, well, not all, almost all of them have Mohammed or some variation of Mohammed in their name. And what we found is if you have very large classes like they do at our Kabul location, how are these kids going to go ahead and find the proper login information? And especially with really young kids, you actually have to go in and you have to go and tap, well, maybe it's this particular user or that one and keep track of them. It was just a horrible mess. So how are we going to solve something like that? Well, that's where Jamf Teacher came into play. And so with Jamf Teacher, you're able to actually take pictures of these students and then they can have that picture show up as the login photo. And so that's something that is special with shared iPads and it doesn't require a photo server to be set up either, which is always great news. So this now allowed us to instead look for the particular picture for our child instead of going through all the different names and hoping you're picking the proper one. Our third challenge that we've run into, the most common one that we actually see, is that we see apps staying grayed out and never loading after they've lost internet connection. 
This one was particularly frustrating because at the time it involved sending an email to me and a lot of back and forth on getting this solved. But to solve this, we essentially on the iPad would press and hold that application until this little window came up to cancel the download. Then back in Jav School, we found that particular device, go into the managed apps, find the application that wasn't loading and then select the retry button. Then we were able to get right back on track. Our fourth challenge, this is actually just one very particular challenge that we had, but this was one that was stumping me for way too long. In fact, I'm almost embarrassed to even tell you about it, but I'm gonna anyways. But there was one iPad in this location out of the entire class that wasn't getting any commands from Jamf Teacher. It was on the same Wi-Fi. Uh, I could pair Bluetooth items to it. I put on a hotspot with the teacher and it still wouldn't work. I followed the steps on the troubleshooting the education golden triangle, which I put a link to that in our session handout. And I was just completely, I couldn't figure it out. What exactly is going on here? Well, and this is where I'm gonna be humbled a little bit. It was actually a really easy fix. Uh, it was on an old version of iOS. And so once I finally looked at something so simple like that, I updated the iPad and it worked just fine. And so that is just a reminder because I think sometimes we all need a little bit of a reminder. Sometimes it's the easy things. Something as simple as making sure you're on the right iOS version could be all that you need to do instead of going in and doing all these crazy little solution fix things that you think might be the issue. The last challenge that I wanted to share with you all is an ongoing challenge that we have with our largest deployments. And that's the iPads running out of space. And we were told to get the biggest capacity iPad for, the, for these locations. Go ahead and keep deleting the photos, the videos, any unused applications. And there's really no end all solution to this, simply managing it as best we can. And so for our largest schools, we've actually had to purchase more iPads in order to kind of spread out the students a little bit more. So those are some challenges that we've had as well as the solutions to those challenges. The last piece that I'd like to share with you all today are some of our victories. Because while having uh, various solutions to our challenges is really awesome, there are some things that really go beyond solving just single technical issues like that. The first was creating a self-help guide. Uh, and this is based on some of the most common issues that I would get. I would get loads of emails every single day on things that I probably didn't need to necessarily do for the facilitators. This maybe could be things that they could be trusted to do themselves. So I granted them more permissions in Jamf School. I gave them accounts in Apple School Manager. And after going through and creating this guide with all the most common emails I would get questions on, my basic troubleshooting time went down 90%. So now I only get emails about needing updates to student roster information, if we need to purchase any applications, and if there's any like above and beyond crazy issues that they are not able to solve themselves. I also do have a copy of this guide in our session handout that you are able to edit. So if this is something that might be useful for some of you, I go ahead, feel free to use it, make it your own. The next piece. So if you remember a long time ago when I was talking about getting the initial student information, that piece is actually really not that bad because initially getting student information in is actually pretty easy. Where the horrible nightmare uh, begins is when you have you know, different trimesters or semesters or different school years. And that is when things will get really hairy. So when it came time to update the students into different grades, we were finding out that I would be getting a class list and maybe the name would be spelled slightly different. And, or I would find that some of the students weren't in the list anymore. Did they have to retake a grade, which is common, or did they leave? Um, did I completely spell the name wrong the first time? And there was no consistency. I have to give props to my good friend that is an Excel wizard, and she did her best to try to match up these names as much as possible to save me time. But there were still thousands of names that were not hitting because they weren't exactly the same. 
So as you can imagine, that is a horrible nightmare. And it would take me like a week to update some of these rosters for our kids. Once I went full time uh, managing the innovation hubs, I knew that was something that had to get dealt with immediately. So instead what we did is I created uh, these numbers documents because numbers is free and we don't have to worry about any paid licenses. Um, I created these templates that shows all the student IDs that I've created on my end, along with the first name, last name, and the current class that I have that student in. I then made another column. So if I have students that need to move into different grades, we can easily input that and I can see it and make sure I'm moving the right child. I also included a section to add in new students. So that student in, uh, initial student intake form doesn't make sense every time, but now I can go ahead and have our students added there. And then if there's any names that are misspelled, I have a section for that too. So this is something that has cut down my week turnaround time on some of these roster changes to be maybe a few hours. And that has made a huge difference. So I then will take this updated student roster information and I send it to my facilitators. So every time they need a change, they go ahead and send it to me. I make the change on my end, send that back to them so that we both have the same copy. And this has been something that has been a really awesome uh, thing that has been dealt with that no longer makes me want to rip out all of my hair. And, you know, but really the most and biggest piece of these victories are the people that are impacted by these shared iPads and the innovation hub spaces. I wanted to share a few students with you um, just so you can see the impact that these places are having. So this is Terrence. He is a student at Musi High School in Zimbabwe, and he has advanced into Coco development and using Xcode after a single year of coding at the hub, which is just insane. I wouldn't be able to do that after a single year. I don't know how many of you could do that either, but it's been really exciting to see some of these kids really flourish. And Terrence isn't the only one. We also do have student-led coding clubs in Kabul, Afghanistan, St. James, Minnesota, and in Urban Ventures, Minnesota. And he's not the only one either. I also wanted to share um, this young woman, Ruth Himbo, who utilized the shared iPads in ways that was a little bit more creative. So she was able to utilize GarageBand to create a song. And she was also able to utilize a microphone to have her voice be in the song as well. So these shared iPads have allowed kids to go ahead and explore creatively in ways that maybe they didn't have access to before. And so she actually created this song called Alive that she uploaded into SoundCloud. And I'd like to just share a really quick little snippet of that song for you all now. And so you're able to see the iPad here with her GarageBand tracks. And again, just gonna play a little quick section of it so you're able to hear it. feeling the groove there. So just a little section of her song. The next young woman that I wanted to share, this is Tendi. So just like Terrence, she has also completed her coding lessons and now she is doing some more ro advanced coding with robotics. So in this picture here, she is actually with the Sphero Rover. Um, I'm sure some of you may have seen that before. It's super cool. And so this is something that, you know, a passion of hers that she didn't realize she had until she got into the innovation hub space and utilizing the shared iPad. And just think of how many students maybe had no idea that they had these talents, had these opportunities not been available to them. And the next piece that I wanna share isn't just individual student like I had, but I wanted to mention um, some of the young girls in our Kabul, Afghanistan location. So I get asked about this location a lot, um, had the incredible pleasure of being able to visit this location just before uh, President Joe Biden announced our withdrawal from the territory. And I just want you to all know, all of our facilitators and our young kids are safe, which was very scary when the Taliban first take, took over. 
but our young girls have actually been able to continue going to school. So after the about two weeks or so after the Taliban takeover, they were able to go back to school. And in this particular uh, video that I want to showcase here, uh, they're using Osmo speed drums, which allows them to create music by selecting the different colors. So that's what they're doing there when they're tapping all the different things there. And the innovation hub in Kabul has been seen as an oasis for these kids during these turbulent times. And that is coming from our uh, kids as well as our facilitators. So it makes me feel really happy that this is a place where they can feel safe and just for a moment be able to not worry about everything else that is happening outside of those walls. And the last piece that I wanted to cover are some of these statistics that I think some of you might be uh, interested in hearing about. So right now we have almost 3,000 kids that are currently active worldwide and that number is simply growing as we continue to add more locations. We've also found that when we've surveyed our kids, they've overwhelmingly enjoyed coming in, into the hub and they find it really valuable regardless of the location that they're at. The next piece, and this piece kind of, I get a little sensitive about it, more kids are coming to school. So what we find is that in a lot of these developing countries, especially in Haiti is a really great example, you go through and you take your classes, but if you don't pass one of the grades, you have to pay to take it again. And as you can imagine for some of these families, they just don't have the extra money to allow their kids to retake a grade. So that's just where their education ends. And for a lot of these kids in other of these countries, um, these administrators and teachers will be very blunt about how they feel on some of these kids. And this is again, where I get kind of emotional. Um, we've had some of these adults tell us that child is stupid. That child is dumb. Don't even waste your time, which is an incredibly shocking thing to hear a, a teacher, a facilitator, or not a facilitator, an administrator to say about a child, right? And so what we find is that when we bring these innovation hubs to these locations, that child that has been completely written off by these adults that should be helping and supporting them, they're the ones that flourish. They're the ones that are teaching everyone else what to do in that hub. And so suddenly we see these kids that instead of being beaten down every day by these teachers that say, you know, they don't learn in this exact way that I teach, they're stupid. We're now seeing that they want to come to school. They want to continue learning because now they have another place that allows them to learn in a way that's different than what they've been taught before. And I think we can all agree education is the best way to lift up communities to help people come out of poverty and it also helps with our young girls too getting educated and bringing up countries and so just seeing more and more kids coming to school and we've had to buy more ipads because more kids keep coming consistently and that is such a win and so that is the statistic that i'm the most proud of um, that we see these kids wanting to be involved in coming to school. And the last piece, job creation. So we have a facilitator or two at every single location and they're all hired locally. These innovation hubs are built locally. We're not sending Americans over to build this for free. Uh, we are paying the local community to build these, to maintain these locations. And our hope is that once these kids go through these innovation hubs, they're then able to be ready to actually go and be employed. And so these innovation hubs with access to these shared iPads are not just helping these students while they're in school. We're hoping that it's going far and beyond that to actually helping their community and being able to give back to the people that have helped them there. And so I've covered uh, many items here today. And if you're interested in learning more about these innovation hubs, I do have some links on some more information uh, in our session handout if you want to learn more. So we've covered the setup, which includes which MDM we want, the setup of the devices themselves, getting student information. We've talked about deploying these devices and where they go. We've also talked about some of the challenges that we've run into with these shared iPads, as well as the solutions to those challenges. And finally, we've talked about some of the victories of real world impacts they are making on these students and these communities around the world. 
At this point, for any of you online, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. And at this point, I would like to thank you all so much for taking the time to join me today. I hope this has been valuable. And again, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have during this session. Thank you.